All right. Well, thank you again for joining. Um, I really am very grateful to be in this space with everybody today. Uh, it's been a whirlwind of the last week and a half, and I know that that has directly impacted um, so many in our community and friends and families of folks in our community. And there really aren't any answers. All we can say is it's it's tragic, it's painful, and it's really hard to just even find the words to explain it. So today our goal is to create a space for empathy, understanding, and reflection. Again, our panelists won't be asked to have all the answers, but they have come together uh, to be a part of this community. So a huge thank you to the panelists who have joined us. And it is important to note that we as a DU community and in this space do not tolerate any Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, or any other form of harm um, and hate in this space. And so please do keep that in mind as you're reflecting and uh, thinking about empathy towards everyone that's being affected by this situation. Uh, we are incredibly grateful to have a group of panelists that I just have to give a huge shout out to because they literally joined within the past, some of them even within the past two hours. And so it has been incredible to see everybody come together to share their different expertise areas. And so um, we are sad to report that um, uh, Ahmed Abdrabu will not be able to join us today. He unfortunately got sick and had to cancel classes and also not be here with us today. So we're wishing him uh, getting well, fast healing. We know he has a lot going on. And so thinking about him in this space, but we do have, um, uh, Professor Micheline Ishai, who is joining us today. And then we have uh, Angela Michener from uh, the Health and Counseling Center. Gwen Mitchell, uh, who is an associate professor in the MA program in International Disaster Psychology. Professor Ann Petrilla, uh, who is a professor of practice at GSSW. And then last but not least here in terms of professors, we have uh, Jonathan Sharkin, who is joining us from uh, the history department and Judaic studies. And then we are really honored uh, truly to have um, two panelists as well uh, from the community, Lily Gross, who is the DU Director of Halal, and then um, Ahmed, who's joined us, and uh, he's getting his camera on now, I think, um, but Ahmed Hussein uh, is the president of the Muslim Student Association here at the University of Denver, and I no, I can speak for myself, but so many others that it means a lot to have you both on this call. And Ahmed, as a student, um, thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, today will be conversational. We will have a Q&A function open. We will not have the chat open so that people can really take time to reflect and listen. And the last thing I want to do, and I promise you can all hear me stop speaking and hear from people that know a lot more than me, is I do want to take a moment for a land acknowledgement. Um, and in the spirit of healing, peace, and justice to acknowledge and honor the indigenous peoples of the land upon which DU stands, the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Ute tribes. Like the history of so many institutions in the American West, ours is complex and sometimes painful. And in recognition of this fact and to underscore our commitment to inclusion and equity, we do commit to listen to and affirm the stories of all in our community. And C plus V is committed to this as well. So we do invite you to visit the um, Native American Indigenous Initiatives website at DU, and I'll drop that in the chat for folks to see. Um, and with that, I'm really honored and thankful to Chancellor Jeremy Hafner, who has joined um, to open our session. Well, thank you, Chase. And thank you all so much for joining this very important C plus V community talk. There is, and continues to be, and will be, tremendous disbelief pain and grief and shock as the world watches the conflict in the Middle East continue to evolve in real time. But I am so grateful to be a part of this intellectual community where we can come together and find greater understanding through a wide range of expertise on campus. Last night, I was able to attend a superb discussion by DU faculty from the Center of Middle East Studies, sponsored by the Corbell School of International Studies. Today, we'll widen that expertise with faculty and staff from across the university. And I know it will be a rich discourse and dialogue about this very complex geopolitical issue the world is facing. So 
to our panelists, thank you. Thank you so much for coming together on short notice and for bringing your expertise. These topics, as you well know, are not always easy to talk about, but they are so important. They're important to have at a university like the University of Denver. It's, they are critical. And so I'm grateful to you for lending us your time and your knowledge on this. And to all of those who are watching, thank you again for joining us today. I hope that today's discussion in some way illuminates and informs you on a very, very serious and complex geopolitical crisis. Now with that, I am very, very pleased to turn it over to Vice Chancellor for Human Resource and Inclusive Excellence, Jeff Banks. Jeff, thank, thank you. you. Chancellor Havener. And I will do my very best to moderate this, this uh, conversation, this discussion. Uh, we, again, we have an excellent panel. And so uh, given the time, I, I do want to get right into the line of questioning and give the, the panelists ample opportunity to respond. Uh, so one of the first questions that we have, and, and this is you know, echoing the chancellor, that this is an extraordinarily complex situation. And so I think what would be best is if we could start with a basic understanding of how we got here and what is the current state uh, of the crisis and the war in Israel and Gaza currently. Um, and if I could get uh, Professor Ishai and, and perhaps Professor uh, Sharkon to help us with that. Again, a basic understanding of how we got here and what's the current state of the crisis and the war in Israel and Gaza. Okay, thank, thank you for having me here. I think those are wonderful um, forum for discussions at the DU community. So I'm I'm really um, applaud the chancellor for doing this. Uh, I I would start to just by as October seven. October seven is a, now an infamous day in many people's mind. It's when Hamas attack Israel in an in a surprise attack, an attack that really was reminiscent in some way for many Israeli to, um, to the Yom Kippur attack of 1973 because it was not expected. Um, it was also surprising because and unprecedented because the scope of the attack and the type of, of uh, attack was not anticipated. Uh, there was a ground forces of Hamas militant that arrives in many southern uh, part of Israel and kibbutzims and, and attacked uh, mercilessly civilian, um, killing, uh, burning, torturing, raping uh, uh, in ways that accounts to this day's people viewed it as act of um, war crimes and even uh, crimes against humanity. The retaliation is ongoing uh, from the Israeli side, uh, and uh, we now have a situations in which the army is considering the Israeli army uh, ground ground uh, troop uh, deployments in Gaza. The question is to what extent, since it's unclear at this point in time. As for the rest, uh, we know that uh, Hamas was uh, allied and uh, by Hamas, which is an Islamist party in the south of Lebanon, which has gained a lot of uh, influence in Lebanese politics. And uh, that very organization is also sponsored and allied with Iran. So that's sort of the, the <laughs> news break. <laughs> this, is, this is what's happening uh, within the past week and a half as to why it's happening. There are a variety of causes that we can think about. Uh, certainly on the Israeli side, the Israeli government and Israeli populations were very distracted by internal crisis since November 2022, when um, Benjamin Netanyahu formed a neutral right government uh, that provoked a lot of mass demonstrations in week after week uh, against the government, which attempted to overhaul the judicial systems and attempted uh, to annex the West Bank. Uh, that also provoked Palestinians' resistance in the West Bank and conflict with settlers. So that's on the one hand. On the other hand, we saw the continuing duress, of course, of uh, Palestinians and the blockades in, in Gaza. Uh, uh, but at the same time, when we're considering about the timing, we also know that there was uh, the third round of Abraham Accord that was an under unfolding between Saudi Arabia 
and in Israel, in which negotiations were discussed and the Saudi were provided some form of security protections in order to undertake the deals and normalizations with Israel. So to that extent, that led to uh, angers by the Iranian, uh, feeling that uh, the Saudi Arabia and the Gulf country were becoming stronger in the Gulf countries, in, in, the, in, the, in, that, in that part of the, the Arab world, and uh, most likely were um, ready, more than ready and eager to, to provide the level of assistance necessary for Hamas to undertake its operation. So I'm going to leave it that way. If, you, if if Jonathan wants to jump in, I, I OK. Yeah, th thank you, Micheline. And I'm really happy you you focused on sort of the more recent micro issues. Um, I'll step back and I, I know I only have one or two minutes and I cannot do justice to this issue. So I will try to provide some macro level overview. So the way when I when I go back in my courses and, and you know, other historians may disagree, but the way I try to periodize sort of the broader conflict, the period from around 1948 to 1979 was largely, though not solely, a period of conventional war between Israel and other nation states, which had conventional militaries. Since around 1979, you could argue post-1982, the Lebanon War, where Syria's military was also involved, we've largely seen Israel engaged in, um, in, in military actions against non-state actors, whether we're talking about Hezbollah, whether we're talking about Hamas or Islamic Jihad. Um, and so in a sense, this is just a further extension of that. Um, but, you know, there's obviously much more I could say going back over the last 15 years. But um, shifting to, to a different point, and here I want to also bring in outside powers, bring in the United States and, and talk about sort of foreign policy. Um, what I think has also brought us here today is a combination of multiple states marginalizing um, Palestinians over over the last 20 or 25 years. I want to be clear that this in no way is me saying it, in any way excusing Hamas's actions, which were atrocious, violated international law, um, and are, are quite frankly war crimes. What I'm trying to highlight here is that the, the previous two administrations, well, the current one and the last one in the United States, the Trump administration and the, and the Biden administration, in concert with states in the Arab world and in concert with the Israeli government, have effectively attempted to circumvent the Palestinian issue, in my view, in order to contain Iran, in order to, in a sense, try to bring about a real peace between Israel and Arab states, um, but also in order to allow the United States to pivot its attention away from the Middle East to other theaters in the world, especially to East Asia. Um, and so I understand sort of the strategic um, reasoning behind this, um, but I think in, in ignoring and marginalizing all Palestinians, not just in Gaza, this, this has created really difficult, a really difficult condition where my guess, um, and, and you know, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken sort of referred to this, my guess is that Hamas viewed this as their only chance to remain relevant. And again, this is in no way excusing anything Hamas has done. I want to just slightly differentiate this from what the second, what the George W. Bush administration did in the second half of its time in office and what the Obama administration did. They took what I would um, categorize as more of a carrot and stick approach to Fatah in the West Bank and Hamas in, in Gaza, which is if you're a Palestinian and play ball, you get sort of the West Bank, which is not perfect, but it's better than Gaza. And if you don't play ball with sort of US policy, you get Gaza, which is a blockaded area for, for 15, 16 years. Um, but both administrations, the second half of the Bush administration and the Obama administration, really worked hard, I think, to try, and they failed, but I think they they worked somewhat hard to deliver things for Mahmoud Abbas, the president of the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank, to try to uphold his legitimacy. Um, I think the previous two administrations have totally moved away from that to the point where Palestinians in both the West Bank and Gaza felt like they were totally marginalized. Um, again, this does not excuse anything we're seeing now. And I just wanted to help from my perspective, explain part of the reason why I think we are where we are today, but it does not in any way explain the whole picture. Thank you both for such comprehensive summaries of the situation. Clearly we could spend uh, several years uh, discussing this and, and uh, have a, you get a degree in this this conflict alone because it's such a deep and intertwined history. And so, thank you again for for so briefly summarizing it. And hopefully, uh, that does set the context for our conversation and give folks 
a basis of knowledge. Um, so I, I wanted to switch gears you know, a little bit, but, but follow up with this question as to how do you believe the conflict impacts the everyday lives of the people on both sides? And I'll start with you, Professor Isha. Oh, yes, on the Israeli side, we know since October 7, there's been a, a great uh, mobilizations of reservists, 300,000 people have been called to serve. Um, a third uh, have been probably dispatched and deployed in the northern uh, borders of Israel and two thirds uh, along the Gaza border. Uh, so that the whole country, Israel is in a state of war uh, and most people feel uh, and an existential threat. That's the, the general feeling from people, whether they are conservative or they were in the protest movement, uh, they are, that there is a major existential fear. And the whole war, the whole country is in a sort of economy and mobilization, a state of war. So in that sense, it is completely impacting right now. Uh, the Israeli on the side of the Palestinian, we know that as a result of the impending uh, announcement of from the um, Israeli defense, that there will be potentially a ground uh, deployment in Gaza uh, that has created call for evacuations of the Gazan population to the south of Gaza, uh, nearby the Rafah crossing, where there allegedly will be um, humanitarian corridor, not humanitarian, humanitarian assistance uh, provided. But this has created a humanitarian disaster because it's very difficult for that amount of populations to move as quickly as it's supposed to, to the south, uh, there is no preparations for that. And so they are uh, they are experiencing a very large level of duress uh, as we speak. So uh, both uh, Gaza and Israel are in a great, great difficulty with respect to its populations uh, and, I, and probably without being relativizing the argument that Gaza and I are even in a worse uh, state. And um, just to, to build on Micheline's point and to broaden it a little, I, I Micheline did a tremendous job, I think, there of, of highlighting what things are like on the ground. I just, and I know this is taking the question in a little different way, Jeff, but I just want to remind everyone in the audience as well that there is a gigantic Palestinian diaspora and a gigantic Jewish diaspora around the world, um, and that these 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 events are impacting those communities who have familial ties, who have friendship ties. Um, I'm seeing it play out, you know, in, in quite honestly in my own family, I'm seeing it play out online in social media. Um, and, and unfortunately in many instances with a lot of dehumanization of, of, of the groups involved. And so I just wanted to, to mention that it's not just, obviously it is an existential um, event for, uh, there, it, these issues are existential for the people in the area. Um, but these issues are very real for people outside of, of Israel-Palestine as well, and we need to keep that in mind. Uh, Let me, oh, go ahead. Go ahead just as, as a follow-up to what Jonathan said, I think this is very much uh, the case. In fact, even in cases of lack of information, so potential disinformation, uh, in the diaspora, there's been, uh, um, after the bomb or uh, bombing of uh, the hospital in Gaza, uh, there has been uh, now it's unclear whether it was uh, the the Israeli. It, there are enough evidence to suggest otherwise. But uh, soon after the that happened, there's been many religious sites around the world that were just the target of um, uh, they were desecrated, de 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 they burned Tunisia, Portugal, Berlin, and and other Western countries. So people have a tendency to react very fast, be, be even before hearing the the fact and even if they hear the fact those those uh those actions are, are to be condemned for sure so i completely in, in agreement with jonathan that that the community in the diaspora is being very much uh um impacted as well yes professor, professor patricia i believe you were going to say something <clears throat> yeah the other thing i just wanted to say is that um the other thing that happens in a situation like this where the entire culture and society is involved um, and impacted somehow, that includes the people who are typically the, the helpers and the support, and um, which makes it very, very difficult to um, for people to know who they can go to or to be the one that um, people are coming to if you are that person. So I think that's very important to keep in mind as well, both within the, these countries and the diaspora, as you have mentioned. 
Absolutely, absolutely. So um, as a follow up to that, uh, you know, what, what are you all uh, hearing or seeing um, as far as the impact of mental health and well-being for the folks either living in the conflict zone or have friends and relatives uh, without the conflict zone? Perhaps I can jump in to bridge kind of all three really insightful shares. You know, if you don't hold these identities, I think something that's important to, is that ask your Jewish and Palestinian friends and, you know, how they are doing. Similar to post-George Floyd, people are struggling. And what's unique about this kind of active issue as well as the diaspora, it's usually a, about a one degree of separation, which means people you know who hold these identities likely know someone who's been lost, right? So it's actively impacting folks. But as I say that, I think also clinically, we've kind of globalized the term PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. And I once had a Palestinian colleague tell me like, well, we don't call it that because there's no P here, right? There's no post. And, and our in, incredible literature has come out of the uh, kind of uh, way dating back to um, uh, Denali and Barone talking about transgenerational trauma and things that the pathos of these of these communities, it's kind of preclinical, but folks are suffering. And so as we can think through how we can support not to, I don't even think there should be a D either. Like this isn't disordered, it's active. And when folks are hearing these alarms go off, they have about five minutes to find safety. Um, in a really creative way, uh, some of the Jewish kind of psychosocial community have created what they call absorption centers. And they're really psychosocial social spaces to go and knit or connect or do something because we can't live we physically can't live in fight flight or freeze right it's not a, it's not possible and so how it it kind of wreaks havoc on our immune system and our sleep cycles and all of this is true within actively what's happening there as well as with again this kind of vicariously in our in our diaspora community and for those of us you know kind of paying attention and experiencing empathy so i'll i'll stop there but i think there's this piece that this is none of this should be considered uh, um, anything as it relates to diagnosis, but kind of this preclinical distress that folks are really suffering with and that um, how we check in really matters in, 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 sub, in, in this idea of this collective distress, you know, collective trauma, it then calls for collective healing. Um, so how we do that, we need to kind of lean in. Thank you for that lean in. And again, the collective stress, we, we're all as as our, as our DU community as a whole, but also our global community, all experiencing this together and, and different levels of, of uh, connection. And, and as we mentioned, the degrees of separation, um, we, we are all in this together and we need to be supportive of one another. Uh, I do see a few hands up and I want to make sure I, I call on them. Uh, um, uh, Angela, missionary. Thank you. Yeah, I wasn't sure if we're doing hands up or how to jump in. So I'll just... That's how I'll do it. Um, and yeah, just to uh, go off of this idea of intergenerational trauma or complex trauma, um, a lot of my work that I've done has been working with Indigenous communities in on Turtle Island in, in Canada and the U.S. And what you see here is this is a conflict, like just to draw parallels here, this is a conflict that has been going on for 70 plus years. Um, so we're not just dealing with the trauma of the last seven days, but we're dealing with generations of trauma, both in the um, area and in the diaspora. So it's it's more complex than wartime trauma as well, because people are bringing in generations of this pain and hurt and lack of safety. Indeed. And Ahmad, Ahmad I think you had your hand up as well. Yes. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I, in no way, can articulate my words as beautifully as Professor O'Shea and Jonathan, Professor Jonathan. Um, but I would like to echo your statements. Professor O'Shea, you mentioned existential dread, and uh, Professor uh, 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 Gwen, sorry, you mentioned uh, trans uh, generational trauma. And these are very uh, deep words that you give out. I'm so glad that you guys mentioned this. You know, the when we think about the impact, of course, the primary receiver of the impact, the primary victim are these innocent people uh, on site. Well, let's zoom out for a little bit and I'd like to give you a student perspective. 
Um, I'm the president of the Muslim Student Association, and I hear day after day the effects that everything without taking sides, just this whole conflict is having on us as students. I like almost nightmares, really, just from seeing and just from hearing all the news that's been going on. Um, just like almost nightmares, really, of what to do. And it's not even nightmares about, you know, I see some people being killed or something. No, it's really what I need to do as president of MSA in order to um, cater for my people that I'm representing, which is, which are the, the Muslims on campus. Now, specifically, uh, the Muslims here at DU, since we're talking about the DU community, this even though this isn't a Muslim or you know Jewish problem, it's a human problem. Because it's a human problem, we want to feel uh, our voices heard. And I believe that that is the biggest thing that's giving us all the stress. It's giving us these nightmares that causes us to skip class, sleep in, and not focus in class. And what do we have to tell our professors? We have to go to office hours and be like, you know, professor, I really need an extension on this assignment. There is a big assignment that I have to, had due yesterday, and I got an extension, which isn't fair to everyone else, right? This is, if, if we're having this kind of impact, where we can't even focus on our simple classes, I can't even begin to imagine the people, um, like Angela mentioned, who hear a siren and need to react within five minutes. We need to zoom out from the problem a little bit of who's right and who's wrong. Understand the effect that it's having on the people on site and us externally, and try to solve that, which I'm glad, you know, it's what we're here to do today. Well, man, I hear you loud and clear that a part of it is having the space uh, to, to share in the pain and to express uh, what you're going through. And I think that's you know, that's part of part of the, the the purpose of this talk today. And and so as we talk about that as an approach, is is giving space uh, to to breathe and to really uh, share in, in in the experience. Uh, what are some of the other things that we can do to be supportive as a community for each other? And this is for all families. Uh, what can we do to support one another in this, in this broader community? See Angela leaning in. Go ahead, Angela. I mean, yeah, I think we, it's, yeah, folks, as people have mentioned before, we're unfortunately going to see an increase in Islamophobia and anti-Semitic acts. And I think it's really important to support each other and to be there for our community, like for, again, one degree of separation. You know someone who's impacted directly or indirectly um, by this conflict. Um, I think mental health can happen on the individual, the community, and the political level. So as far as supporting your individual mental health, just to let you know, I, I work at the Health and Counseling Center at DU. We always have same-day access, especially between the hours of 1 and 3. Um, after hours, our phone number doubles as a crisis line. So there are always resources available to students to get that support. Um, but also, you know, knowing your limits, taking those media breaks, I get everyone wants to be informed, and it's also okay to step away from it. Um, we are not meant to be, as someone else said, in fight or flight all the time. So taking that time for ourselves. Um, but again, we when trauma happens on a community level, we heal in communities. So attend a vigil, go to different student um, organizations where identity is being honored, you know, call with your family, whatever it needs. And for some of us, health, uh, mental health care also means taking some political action, um, whether that's, you know, donating to an organization that offers relief or writing to a representative. For some of us, that can be a very healing part of the process as well. So I kind of like to think of it on different levels and making sure you're meeting those needs. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I see hands with Lily. I haven't heard from you. Hi. Um, thank you, everybody, for all of your words. 
And Ahmed, I want to echo what you're saying about um, using our voices and how powerful and important it is. Um, and I want to say that we should all use our voices and hopefully in a way that can come together. Um, what I see so prevalent right now is just hate creating more hate. And um, what I urge us all to do is come together in the name of love and ask how we can create that as a community. And um, I think, you know, as we are removed because we are in America, um, even if we are connected in, in many different ways, um, to really, really think about how this University of Denver community can come together and um, create solutions that are that are long term, not just for this crisis, um, but for what it means to have deep relationship where we can hear and understand each other. And I think this um, is an amazing opportunity for us to do this. And um, your program last night on Israel um, at the Corbell School was amazing. And um, I just urge us all to be able to use our voices and come from a place of love, even when it's really hard, because we are coming from a place of pain and grief. And we should feel those emotions. We should feel deeply the pain and grief for all of the lives of the people of Palestine, for Gaza, for Israel. Um, there's a lot of pain and suffering right now, and we need to acknowledge that pain um, and ask ourselves, how how can I actually, in my personal life, come from a place that's not hateful when I'm making these statements? And so I just am, am grateful that it feels so far that we've been able to do that. And um, also want to name that Hillel is a place that anyone is welcome to, Jewish, not Jewish. Um, we can all hold grief together and um, we hold all of those pains and all of that life um, and that loss of life um, for all people. Thank you, Lily. That was so well said. And it, it does make me very proud to be a part of an institution where we can have a free expression, where we can have the civil discourse and really examine these issues and share with one another and actually come together. And that's, that's what is so important. So it really, really heartens me to hear you hear you say that and really um, I'm taking that to heart. So hopefully this is just the beginning. This community talk is the beginning of, of a long process that we all come together as community and, and heal and support one another through this process. Ahmed, did you have another comment you wanted to make? I wasn't sure if I saw your hand. Yes, you have a good idea. Thank you. Uh, you know, I, I wanted to mention two main points as to what we can do and what would help our community the most. Um, it's easier to be specific to the DU community and that's why we've come together here today. So let's do that. Um, first, we can look at the perspective uh, or the side of the university as a whole and um, what it provides to students. The most important thing that I have seen is the equal representation. Without equal representation, students will feel excluded and it has happened already. Um, there are over 1,000 comments. It's probably probably more on a post that the university made. Um, I'm not bringing this up to Backlash University. This is my university. I'm here because I love it. But I'm also here. Like, but I'm also uh, uh, here to criticize when needed, because love doesn't come without criticism. Otherwise, it's just fake love, right? Now. If there's a thousand plus comments and most of them are in disagreement um, with the statement that has come out. Now I'm not saying the statement needs to go back and change, no. Like that's up to the university and that's up to their judgment. But what I am saying is look at the importance of this to the students. Look at the importance of how the, what the university says that they're under impacts their lives and their confidence in even attending here. Mm -hmm. We need equal representation. On top of that, maybe another example that I can give, um, in the introduction that was given today, and with all due respect, uh, Professor Ishe, like I really, you know, you're, you're a scholar, right? Historical scholar. And even yesterday, I enjoyed your talk and you guys covered a lot of ground. 
Um, but one thing today that I would have uh, preferred that you mentioned is also everything that has happened, including the bombing, the bombings on the Gaza Strip and the details of those. Um, what I've seen, uh, and not, again, not to point fingers, is the mention of the Hamas attack on October 7th and then skipping of what we call the genocide that is going on right now in Palestine. And coming to certain points like the uh, hospital bombing and how now this is only being mentioned because it's wishy-washy dependent, like, you know, who we don't know who made who did the bombing. And that's the only reason that this is mentioned. But we don't, we fail to mention everything else that's in between. You know, I'm not telling you to take sides, right? That's what we should avoid doing. We're not here to, again, like we're here to provide support to our community. We're not here to push our uh, perspective. As much as we would love to like to do that, we all have our own narratives, but that's not going to get us anywhere. We're here, again, to provide support to our community. And I think the best way to do that, coming from the university and uh, staff, faculty, and students, is to stop this, you know, free Palestine, no, 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 free Israel, no, no, if you don't agree with me, you know, if you don't agree with me, then you're a terrorist. This doesn't get us anywhere. It really doesn't. And as much as we are passionate about either side, it does not get us anywhere. So as do you, we need to focus on, again, equal representation without taking sides. Um, and then to move on to what we can do uh, for our students. <clears throat> you know, the I heard, you know, like there's a, there's a kind of a suggestion that's been going around to avoid social media. And personally, I would say I disagree with this. But it doesn't mean I'm telling you that you need to be on social media 24-7. Even social media, I would say, limited to an hour a day. My time limit is set to 30 minutes a day for Instagram because I cannot like physically handle more than that. But why do I disagree with the statement that you should avoid social media? Because social media gives you the ability to choose your sources. And it gives you the ability to uh, scrutinize those sources to see which ones are uh, pushing a certain bias. And this is very important in this day and age. If we stick to just a certain news source, like Fox News, like I'm not, you know, that's just the first thing that came to my mind. I don't really like know anything about Fox News, but if we stick to just Fox News, we're just gonna hear from Fox News' unbiased, or, or sorry, like, you know, whatever uh, opinion or whatever they're pushing. Social media allows us to let that not happen. And we can choose to follow pages that uh, are pushing support for Israel and pushing support for Palestine and educate ourselves from both sides to again, put forth equal representation. And lastly, we as leaders, we're not in this position to, you know, get, you know, like uh, praise is the word I'm looking for. By you know, like, oh man, you're you're so amazing. You're uh, here speaking for us. This isn't this isn't what why we're leaders. We're leaders to organize things that actually work for the people that we're we're uh, representing. So, if I'm saying you know I'm the president of MSA, I have the responsibility to make sure that the people who are a part of this student club are not only represented, but they feel like they can actually be safe on this campus. It's one of the main purposes. And so we as leaders should provide uh, the resources that we like gather together today, for example, and resources specific to whatever org we have. For example, to make that make more sense, MSA uh, stands for Muslim Student Association. And so as Muslims in Islam, we are very closely connected to God. The number one way for us Muslims to uh, deal with this, with everything that's going on with our emotions and uh, with our families that are suffering, whether on site or off site, is to speak to God directly. We pray. And prayer in Islam is not a joke. It's not something that is, you know, oh, please pray for me. We hear this, you know, go around a lot and we don't really mean it sometimes. And that's okay. But what I'm saying is that in Islam, this is something that we take as a first resort, not as a last resort. 
I would recommend uh, to all Muslims and non-Muslims. God isn't here just for Muslims. God is here for everyone. If you're, you know, uh, Angela, thank you so much for mentioning, you know, the, the mental health resources we have here at DU. I can say, like, the mental health resources here are really something else. And this is something I would recommend everyone to do. But specifically for our, uh, you know, for everyone and specifically also for our Muslims, reach out to God. Thank you. Thank you so That's so well said. And I, I do want to offer Professor Shaya opportunity to respond. Um, but again, thank you. But so well, well said. Very good. Yeah, it's always very inspiring to hear the students talking. And I really congratulate both of you, Lily and uh, um, and Ahmed to try to do more coordinated actions as well uh, as a way to understand what is going on. And uh, that is what I used to do when I was a student in graduate school. So the next thing I would like to suggest responding to the equal representations, Ahmed, please know that sometimes people who are invited uh, on the Palestinian side, which is, was a major effort I did at the last minute, might say that they don't wish to come because of stress, emotional stress, and they simply don't want to be part of the, the panels, which is what happened uh, uh, yesterday. So if you didn't see the number of representation you want, it's not because of lack of effort to bring it to the panel, it's because people couldn't and didn't wish to do it uh, at, within a week after all what was going on. As for your remark about not mentioning the bombing in, in the hospital of al Ahi in Gaza, uh, please know that there was investigations that is unfolding with respect to that bombing. I was among the first people, among a few people, I'm sure, when that happened, who thought that Israeli probably committed, probably most likely out of negligence, uh, from my reading of the way the Israeli uh, worked on this. Um, but then I found that there was enough evidence, evidence to make me think otherwise. Uh, I started reviewing a lot of the documents, and I thought, uh, informing myself and looking at different type of presses, I uh, realized that uh, certainly it's not out of the habit of the Israeli to, to, to throw missiles on the side of Gaza. If anything, they, they go with air, air bombing and not with missile. That is usually a Gaza uh, instrument, so, uh, you know, not an Israeli one. Second, I also looked at what the United States discussed with respect to satellite and how it was taking the images at the time, the reports of the Israelis about Islamic al-Jihad and its negligence, and other organizations, the third party Ukraine organizations that uh, actually make satellites, uh, pictures about the events, all that to, to just uh, make a long story short, made me move to the other direction that if there was, it may not have been the Israelis who have committed and perpetrated something that would have been more than just war negligence in that sense. Uh, so uh, that's the reason probably I didn't wish to speak about that, but had no one asked me, I would have uh, just told exactly how my thought process was going. I think the jury is out. We will have more investigations on this, but this is where I'm, I'm standing at this point in time. And I might change if there are more evidence that go the other way around. But right now, this is where I stand. So with respect to words, the way we use words, the word genocide means certain things in international conventions. So when you use the word genocide, it's not ethnic cleansing. You have to prove intentionality of wanting to just eradicate an, a specific group, a specific nationality. That has not yet been uh, the case on the Israeli side. However, atrocious in your side, the violations of human rights for Palestinians are. Uh, the Arab Israeli who don't suffer from that level of ethnic cleansing, and they are, and and uh, there is no yet statement of the Israeli government aside from ultra white um, people who have done such argument that uh, that there is an effort for genocide. So on the other side, however, we're using the social the charters of 1987 with Hamas and the two, not the 2017 but the charter of Hamas. There are argument of intentionally wanting the destructions of the people. So here, uh, the, la the language of genocide side is more close from an international law perspective. So I just want to say, I don't usually use those terms, but because I'm very careful as to the, their weight in international law, in international humanitarian law, I don't even use the word terrorist. I don't use the word genocide. I don't even use the word apartheid. I usually use languages that are less inflammatory, and I hope you would uh, remind yourself that's what I was trying to do yesterday.
Thank you, Professor Ishai, for your response and for that for that uh, explanation of the, those terms. Uh, uh, Professor Pachilla had a comment. And I believe your microphone is still muted, Professor. Thank you. I apologize. Um, in response to Lily and Ahmed and um, and Micheline's comments about um, narrative, basically use of language, um, I would just like to say that. Um, in my experience, which has been um, primarily in uh, war and post-war um, regions in Eastern Europe, that the this idea of the narrative is so important to pay attention to and what that means. And right now we're hearing a lot of that word used a lot um, in in panels, in media, in lots of different ways. And, and right now in this extraordinary crisis that's happening, the narrative um, tends to be controlled by media, by organizations, ideology, governments, um, whoever can get the, the microphone. And it's only later when things have um, settled down, whatever that might look like, um, to where people are not in an active crisis, literally fighting for their lives or mourning the loss of life, that we can start to focus on personal narratives and people's experiences. And um, that's when the um, lived experience of people can really be um, paid attention to and documented and can can go a long way to counter um, a lot of the other narratives that are out there for uh, reasons that may not be directly for the truth. And so I just want to say that um, I think the work that that many of us have to do is coming um, once it's possible to do it when the actual cr extreme crisis has settled down, whenever that might be. Thank you, Professor Pertelia, for that. Um, so um, we're, we're getting a little shorter on time, and I do want to make sure we have time for question and answers uh, from, the, from the larger group. Uh, Chase, do we have any questions uh, we can share with the panelists? Yeah, we do. And I'm synthesizing a number of questions. And thank you so much to everybody who, you know, worked within our norms and the guidelines for this conversation um, <clears throat> and had some really great ones. And so the first one I did want to start out with is uh, I think sometimes we feel like we can talk about this and, and there's all sorts of things, but are there any ways folks on this call, and I can share some resources in the chat as well, but any new sources that might look at things more objectively, do fact checks um, that you would encourage folks to take a look at? And then also, um, I'm a huge believer in showing up for our communities through philanthropy and um, giving of time and uh, if we want to give money. And so are there any resources people might point people to to support all people who are affected uh, by this um, truly the tragic event? So just want to throw that out there if anybody has any recommendations. And I can also drop some uh, links in the chat if if folks have some. Is the questions about informations and disinformations? Is that okay? So uh, I would just advise people to look at GeoConfirm, which is a third party uh, Ukrainian uh, people who have put uh, a lot of collecting data scientifically uh, in a sort of as much possible neutral way in order to evidence what is happening on grounds, not just in in uh, Russia and Ukraine, but also in Syria and then now in Gaza and Israel. Very interesting uh, sort of uh, not partisan way of discussing what's going on. I think that one of the things that I would recommend students, and I think uh, Ahmed just went in this direction, so don't just focus on Fox News. No, we want just uh, the possibility for, for, for everyone to look at as many possible news that are in fact contradictory. And then sometimes you can vet it by looking at the basic common denominators and just said, OK, maybe that might be as close as possible to what is happening on the ground. And I can move forward with that that information. So uh, when, the, for instance, the Alachi Hospital happened, I just went and looked at Al Jazeera uh, and trying to see precisely because it's Al Jazeera, what was its perspective? Then I went back and forth and then look at some Arab news, Israeli news, American news. It takes a lot of work for those of you who are interested in truth to figure out what's going on. So don't react right away. Uh, uh, just check your own bias and your own impulse, which is I had to do it two days ago. I checked my own impulse. I, 
I came with the understanding that something was happening when I then had to challenge it. So I would recommend all of you to do the same, read as much as you possible, different form of pressures in the process. Uh, that's the best possible and um, advice I could provide at this point. That's great advice, Rebecca Ishai. And this is why, again, why civil discourse and free expression is so vitally important. So we can exchange ideas and perspectives and perhaps uh, sources of information that we, we've cultivated to, to really try to sort through this and, and get to the truth of the matter, if that's possible. Ahmed, you had another comment you wanted to make? Yes, uh, I just wanted to echo Professor Ishe's, uh points really quick. I wanted to highlight that this is not easy at all to go to multiple sources and especially to go to sources that are opposing um, your uh, beliefs or what you already have in mind or, or what someone has already told you. But it is super, super, extremely, I don't know any more words to put in, because again, I'm not articulate, important. And it's tough. And uh, actually yesterday at the panel, uh, Professor Ahmed uh, mentioned uh, feigning ignorance and how that's like probably the worst thing you can do. If you want to be on the opposite side of the spectrum of feigning ignorance and being super knowledgeable, then this is exactly what you need to do is you need to go to these multiple sources, especially focus on the sources that oppose your beliefs. Very well said, and there's, there's no doubt that as, a, as an academic institution who specializes in academic excellence is hearing both sides and, and, and discerning the truth um, based on, on evidence-based uh, materials and, and certainly uh, having this discourse, again, it, it's so vitally important to hear different perspectives to help you shape uh, your own thoughts. Uh, Chase, do we have any other questions uh, from, the, from the chat we want to share? Yeah, um, I did want to make space really quick. And was there anything you'd like to add in terms of sources or ways folks can take action? And I do have a question after this as well. I just wanted to follow up on the um, brief discussion about genocide and the um, what that actually is and the legal um, definition and all of those um, and very, very important factors to consider that there is a, a website, genocidewatch.com, I think .com or .org that delineates, um, in my experience, very, very um, helpfully uh, what what um, is a, an, a, an atrocity, a crime against humanity, the stages that of genocide, and um, does a very, very good job of um, discussion of what is happening around the world, actually what has happened um, historically and what is happening now and where countries are and places are in terms of um, heading toward um, greater atrocities. Thank you, Anne. And uh, we're seeing some questions in the Q&A and we will never have enough time for all the questions, but I do wanna honor and bring into the space that there are students, Arab students who do not feel safe on the campus at times. There are Jewish students who do not feel safe on campus. There are community members who do not feel safe. And that is something that DU takes really seriously and that we want to ensure folks have the information about how we're doing that. Um, Jeff, I do wanna, throw that one to you not to catch you off guard but from a human resources inclusive community piece and then we'll be happy to share resources afterwards we've had a number of people talking about ensuring that their students feel safe on campus and that everybody feels supported and safe and and we do commit to that and so jeff is there anything you would add for the community uh, there's no doubt about it that our the campus safety is our number one priority especially as we have uh, crises like this that uh, might lead uh, to uh, to actions uh, that are obviously unwelcome um, that would be targeted to any segment of our community. And so um, we we have and we will continue to maintain a high security profile at DU uh, and to ensure that that all all are safe and all feel safe. And if you uh, don't feel psychologically safe, I think that's one of the important factors as well, is that we have resources available. Uh, we did send out a message last Monday that, that, that pointed to several resources, such as our employee assistance program, such as AC, HCC. Uh, but we also have our, our ombudsperson, um, Betty Schneider, as someone you could talk with, especially if you have an emerging conflict uh, with, with a colleague or a fellow student. Uh, it, we have uh, employee relations 
uh, specialists within HRIC, the Human Resources Inclusive Community that can be supportive uh, in any sort of employment context. Uh, we also have our Office of Equal Opportunity in Title IX. And with that office, if, if you believe that you are uh, experiencing sort of discrimination based on your, your, your um, a religious uh, background, uh, that may be a resource for you to, to report such, uh, such behaviors. And, and have them support you in investigating to, to adjudicate that. So uh, we do have several resources, but above all, you know, we want people to feel safe. If, if anyone does not feel safe, we do have our report, uh, reporting uh, ability. Um, Chase, I don't know if you can throw that in the chat for everyone, uh, but we do have our, our, our guide for which venues to use to report any sort of incidences uh, that you may have experienced or witnessed. And so again, we want to be responsive. We want to be supportive. We do want our community to to feel and stay safe. And so, for those who don't feel safe, let's talk about that. Let's let's bring those folks in and get them the support they need, and make sure we take the steps to ensure our campus remains safe. Yeah, and I would I would add two things there, and that was so helpful. Thank you, Jeff. Is that campus safety is truly a campus partner. I've been on campuses where it feels different. And um, I would say that they are there as a campus partner to help us understand what the processes are. If you call their number and I'll drop it in the chat as well, they will be there for you in an instance. They have been at numerous C plus V events helping us create spaces as much as we can free from harm. And so I will say that. The other piece that I think was just modeled so well by the panelists here is that sometimes we don't have to have the answers. We just need to support the humanity in one another. And so if you have a student who comes to you or a faculty or staff or alum or community member, and even if you don't agree, it really does not matter in that moment. It's about supporting them as a person, hearing their story, hearing their narrative. And we will commit to continue to do that with Community Plus Values. And so that's what I think is the most important thing is that we won't be able to solve everything, but we sure can guarantee that we're going to support everybody on this campus. That's folks from Palestine. That's folks from Israel. That's everybody in between. So please do know we've committed to that. Um, and I do want to make space. I think, Gwen, you have the expertise in this area a lot. Would you be able to speak to that? Yeah, I think it was important to name resources. And then I, you know, I talked about kind of transgenerational, intergenerational trauma, but there's also transgenerational resilience and like resilience as resistance, right? And so there's this piece around what we as a community, um, America's such a young country compared to these countries where what, what we're bearing witness to now. And we're not as good about ritual and and what the French like terminage, just bearing witness. And so it may be as a campus how we can um, just be together and grieve and um, and you know kind of offer courage and support and kindness and I think our two student reps said that so so beautifully and as faculty to support the organization of ritual we have there's um, there's a lot of ways to think that through that would be just honoring of of people's emotional space and that there's not answers but there are resources and then there are ways to to join in community um, that feel important as well. Thank you so much, Gwen. And I do purposely want in the last second here around the resources, Ahmed and Lily, if there's anything you want to share in terms of programming, um, ways to reach out. Uh, Ahmed, did I see your hand go up? Yes, uh, thank you. I, just, I really, really like to say this. Gwen reminded me of something that we learned in my personal communications class. Um, my prayer is out to my professor, Dr. Loftus. She's amazing. And one of the things she taught us is in a negotiation, uh, if you want to come out with, with something that's beneficial to both sides, the very first step is to separate the people from the problem. And when Lily mentioned that we have to show love to each other, that really hit me. We can show love to each other, and this is very important. And one thing I would like to add to this is not just love alone, but love and understanding of humans, you know, and seeing them as a human, putting this, uh, you know, this whole sides thing to the side, putting, choosing sides to a side and putting, uh, you know, acknowledging the narrative that they're going through that they have and just loving as a person and understanding, of course. Thank you.
I think that probably sums it up perfectly. Um, I think we saw civil discourse conversation uh, conversation happen here. And so with that, um, we know that this is only probably the beginning, but a huge, huge thank you to our panelists who joined us on a really, really tough conversation. Um, and Jeff Banks, thank you for always being a light in our community as uh, the leader of human resources and inclusive community. And that is for everybody at DU, um, students, faculty, staff, alums, like come to us. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Michael Bunker, who said he's the chief of campus safety, and you can email him personally um, if you have questions or concerns at michael.bunker at du.edu. We will add the incident form to the uh, website um, for equal opportunity in Title IX if there is an incident of harm or something that you want to report. And uh, please do lean on places of safety and support like the Cultural Center, uh, like Student Affairs and Inclusive Excellence in the Dean of Students Office, um, a Health and Counseling Center. I mean, there's just so many people here on campus and it is hard, but we're here for you. And so thank you so much for joining in today.